Welcome to Cornerstone's Walking with God equipping class. I am Brian, and with me is Matt. Hello. And Scott. Yo. And what we are doing in this class is teaching you how to live the basic Christian life. So this class is built around the discipleship pathway, and this is our 10th session overall, and our second session exploring the category of heart work, internalizing and applying what God has said. So last session, we introduced the idea of heart work. Scott, can you recap that for us a bit? Yeah, so we talked about how the heart is the real you, how it's the biblical term given to describe really the the whole inner self. And heart work then is the process of internalizing biblical truth, having our minds renewed so that we might put off our old selves and put on our new selves, really our new identity that's been created recreated in Christ likeness. And so we, we talked about how heart work is more than just stopping uh, the bad things we're doing. We talked about how it's more than just stapling fruit on and just kind of putting on uh, good actions and how uh, it, it's about something so much deeper than that. And the, the process then results in the transformation that ha- God has called us to in him. Really heart works then the, the bridge to Christ likeness. All right, in this session, we're going to look more closely at that, a closer look at heart work. And here is what we'll talk about. Uh, Two things, the problem of idolatry in our hearts, and then the three steps of heart work that address that problem of idolatry. So we'll start with the heart and idolatry. The last time, Scott's telling us, we saw how central the heart is, and then how all of our thoughts, our behaviors, our emotions can be traced back to the heart. And so to tie that into the rest of the class uh, that we've seen so far, uh, when we hear what God says in Scripture, so we're listening and learning to God in His Word, and then we, you know, wrestle with that in prayer, speaking and relating to God, a lot of the time we're finding that our thoughts, our behaviors, our emotions, all those things we talked about in the last class, they don't match up to what God's telling us, the things that He's saying in His Word. And so clearly what we've seen is that's a heart problem, So then the question is, like, what is the problem? Like, what's going on in our hearts when our lives aren't lining up with what God says? Yeah, so like we looked at last time, right, uh, that is fundamentally a heart problem. And ultimately, every problem that we have in our hearts is at its core a a worship problem. And this isn't just to, like, add layers and layers of of concepts, but the, the problem, the most fundamental problem with our hearts is our worship. God created us to be worshipers. We were created to to worship and to glorify him, but but because he also loves us, he gave us the ability to choose who we will worship. And so we do in our lives at different times we we, we choose who we will worship either worshiping him or someone or something else. Uh, Paul describes the the fundamental problem of humanity at, at the beginning of Romans when he's just looking at kind of the what the the problem um, is with us and how the gospel, that that meets the gospel, that that kind of prepares for the gospel need. It says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And and that's really our problem, right? Is when we choose to worship the creature rather than the creator. As Paul Tripp and and Tim Lane explain in in, in their book, Relationships on, on Relationships, worship is first an identity before it becomes an activity. That is, you and I are worshipers, which is why we worship. Our hearts are always under the control of something, and whatever controls your heart will also control your behavior. So, uh, end quote. I think that's what I'm supposed to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so if our, our hearts are the ultimate answer to the why question, right? We looked at that kind of last week, right? It's, why do we do what we do, right? And I, I, don't, I don't need to ask my kids anymore, like, why did you do that, <laughs> Right? I know why they did that. I know why I do that. Right, and It's because of my heart. So if we know the why question, why we think and feel and do what we do, then, then the real question we should be asking isn't why, but what. Right? What am I worshiping other than God? And, and, the script, and then the concept that Scripture uses to describe the things that we worship other than God are idols, Right? We worship them because we think, wrongly of course, that, that, that we can find in them the things that we actually only find 
in God. We, we worship whatever it is we believe we need. These desires become idols in our hearts and they take the place of God. And so the answer to the what question reveals what, what the actually maybe specific answers to the what question are, re- reveal the idols in our hearts that we worship and begins to give us a glimpse, a really a practical glimpse at the areas in our life where the gospel has not been fully applied. So these same areas are the sources of division and conflict in both our relationships with God and our relationships with others, essentially these idols of the heart. Yeah, so I think that's worth exploring a little more. Um, when we say something like we are worshiping an idol, what exactly are we talking about? What's that experience like and how can we understand it a little better? Yeah, I, I think it's really important for us to understand. Um, Stuart Scott says an idol is anything that we consistently make equal to or more important than God in our attention, desire, devotion, or choices. Um, and what's fascinating about this, and, and Scott is, uh, has alluded to this already, but um, the reality is this can be anything in life. There's anything that's created. It says in that Romans 1 passage, um, the creature rather than the creator. And anything that's created, anything in this world can be an idol. It's anything in our lives that we put first before God. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not even necessarily inherently a bad thing, right? This can be your family. It can be um, health. It can be pleasure. It can be success in a variety of forms, however it's determined. It can be the approval of other people, um, those things aren't in and of themselves always inherently bad, but when those things become more important or uh, take a primary place before God in your life, that's when it becomes an idol, um, and, and that's what it's determined by. It's their place in your heart, and this is first and foremost a, a, an affront to God and his glory, and it also becomes obvious that um, when we do this, when we have this kind of idolatry in our lives, when things, created things, become more important than God in our lives, everything else gets uh, disordered, like the uh, the first button of, uh, of a shirt that is incorrect. All the other buttons are off as well, um, and it has disastrous effects on our earthly relationships on top of our relationship with God. So could you guys give us then maybe some more fleshed out examples of what that might look like in someone's life? Yeah, so I mean... Matt gave us a, a few kind of broad ones, but I mean, even you think through uh, how career could be an idol, right? If, if my career is an idol, I mean, I, I'm, my career is supposed to be important, right? I'm supposed to work hard at it. Like, how, how is that a bad thing? Well, it becomes an idol when I'm uh, looking for career advancement or pursuing career advancement um, and being unfaithful at some of the things God has called me to because of it. Right? When, when I put it in such a, a priority place in my life and in my mind that I'm willing to sin, either clearly, right, either lie or cheat, right? It's obviously become an idol if I'm willing to lie or cheat or steal to get it. Um, or if, if I'm willing to be unfaithful in some of the other areas in life because that's the thing I think is going to bring me the ultimate uh, prize, right? The ultimate happiness, ulti- ultimate um, fulfillment. That's, that's, I think that's one, just one example of how something um, good can become an idol. I, another thing, at least for me, one of the things that, that helps me recognize the idols in my life is, is like the things that I end up daydreaming about. Right, like I mean, this is where even things like like a vacation or even just the weekend, we can see as as idols, because we, they're the thing we're putting our hope in. Like I can get through this because of that. There's right? a sense of salvation almost. Yeah, like it's going to rescue me from the mundaneness or the the badness of my life in some ways. Exactly, exactly. And, and what gets me through this tough day is dreaming about that thing to come, right? Which again, like it's not bad to look forward to, to certain things. But when, when that's where my mind, that's when that's what my mind is captivated by. And then my mind's not captivated by God and who he is and everything that he's done and his glorious grace and his love and his provision and his strength and his care and his comfort for me. When I'm not captivated by that, then I'm obviously doing more than just desiring this other thing, desiring this vacation, desiring this uh, weekend, uh, but I'm, I'm worshiping it. Yeah, and I think maybe on the flip side of that, 
not only our dreams, but our nightmares as well. Yeah. The things yeah. we're afraid of losing, maybe the things, uh, um, for example, something that is obviously held up as a good thing in Christianity and in, in the Bible is family, right? Um, but family can easily become an idol for people as well. Uh, where there's this constant worry and fear about how your kids are going to grow up or about um, your relationship with your wife or your, your, your husband, R- whatever the situation, there's this uh, all-consuming fear, maybe like uh, this worry and anxiety that c- flows out of that because this family relationships that you have, these are going to be the things that give you meaning and purpose and significance and joy, and they're the core of who you are, and they're why you live. And if you lose that or if you're afraid of losing that, it produces this nightmare and this dis- dis- just uh, destruction in your own life um, and can be an indication of something that is in place of um, uh, God in your life. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so it sounds like there are like a very large amount of idols that can be a part of anyone's life, including mine. But then when I think about that, I kind of think, okay, it seems like though I'm like, I'm basically picking these idols at some level based on what they're going to give me. And so it, it kind of seems to me like the whole, like I choose the idols I think will give me what I want when I want it. Well, yeah, and I think that's exactly true, right? And I think that we, we should help people to identify, um, and even in ourselves, identify the specific idols that, that they worship, whether it's for them it's career, or them it's family, or them it's control, or health, um, or escape, or fun, or whatever it is. Um, and, and I think that it's, that's helpful, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in, in, in just a few minutes. But the truth is that that ultimately, the, whatever idols we worship all have one thing in common. And the one thing, the one kind of consistent theme in all of our idols is that they serve me, right? That I, I ultimately worship these because I, they are, th- like you said, they're the things that I believe are going to deliver for me. And the reason I don't worship the same things that you do is because you think certain things are going to deliver for you. And I'm like, nah, those things might not deliver for me, right? But these are the things that I think are going to serve me best. And ultimately, so ultimately all of our idols have, the one thing they have in common is self-worship. All idols and all different forms of idolatry are essentially self-worship at their core. And an an illustration of this can be found in, in Jeremiah 44, which is kind of like a a random place to go, but I think we, we see it actually in, in, in Technicolor because the people uh, verbalize in this passage what, um, what honestly a, a lot of us feel in our hearts, but feel too ashamed or feel like we know better than to say out loud. But in, in Jeremiah 44, the, the people of God who are being attacked by other nations, taken into exile, they'd, a, a segment of them had turned to Egypt for their hope. Right? So instead of turning to God, they've been like, you know what? If we just went to Egypt, Egypt would protect us. Right? If we just went to Egypt, Egypt would keep us safe. Egypt will be our, um, our well, in, in that sense, be our hope. And they were essentially then looking to Egypt kind of like an idol, right, for their salvation. Um, and Jeremiah is prophesying to these people. And in, in chapter 44, starting with verse 13, he says, he's speaking uh, the words of God. And God says, I will punish those who dwell in the land of Egypt as I have punished Jerusalem with the sword, with famine, with pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah have, who have come to live in the land of Egypt shall escape or survive or return to the land of Judah to which they desire to return to dwell there. For they shall not return except some fugitives, right? So there's this huge kind of declaration of judgment here, a warning against God's people that... When you turn to, to, to idols, it, it does not work out, right? And God is a righteously jealous God. And, but then the people, they respond to this, this warning. They respond to this declaration of judgment. And it says, Then all the men who knew that their wives had made offerings to other gods, all the women who stood by a great assembly, all the people who lived in Pathros in the land of Egypt answered Jeremiah. And you're like, okay, Right? We realize that, you know, that you're like, what are they going to say, right? They're going to say like, oh, okay, you're right. We've been foolish. So no, he says, as for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's about as clear as it gets, right? But, but we will do everything that we have vowed. We'll make offerings to the queen of heaven. We're going to pour out drink offerings to her as we did both we and our fathers and our kings and our officials in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. 
Like, why? Like, why would you be so brazenly rebellious against God and his prophet? And they give the reason. He says, because, for, then, when we did these things, we had plenty of food, and we prospered and saw no disaster. But since we left off making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we've lacked everything and have been consumed by a sword and with famine. Why? Because we think our idols deliver. And I think in the midst of our hearts, that's ultimately why we worship career and health or family or control or anything else is because we're like, well, but if I stop, things aren't going to go well for me. I actually think that this idol is going to deliver hmm. and we make it about us. And so we continue on down that path. I think that's such a powerful, I mean, that's just a, such a powerful picture of the motivation behind so much of our idolatry. As you were talking, I was thinking about the fact, just contrasting it with our worship of God. Um, mm. As Christians, we worship God because of how inherently glorious and amazing and beautiful he is. It's like yeah. centered on him. But all these idolatries, they like kind of curve back in on ourselves where they serve to really bring bring me what I want. Like yeah. Brian said earlier, I get whatever I want, when I want it, how I want it. This idea of they're functioning to serve me rather than just me being caught up in the gloriousness and greatness of who God is. And what a sharp contrast that is and a really beautiful reminder of, of our need to really repent of, of this self-worship. Yeah, I mean, isn't that fascinating, right? We don't worship our idols because they are inherently worthy of worship. Right. <laughs> but we, we yeah, we worship them because... Uh, of this just inward focus. They bring us something that yeah. we want to yeah. serve us. But yeah. that's what's so sad is that they don't. Like, I mean, exactly. the, the picture is of me sort of on a throne, like, hey, I'm going to get the idols that I want to give me what I want. But the reality the Bible would paint is that I'm actually enslaved to them. So mm. like the motivation is I'm going to get all these things to serve me and deliver what I think because I'm in control. And then at the end of the day, I'm the one that's running around doing whatever they want. Mm hmm. So it's so there's there's the problem, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a pretty significant they one. They can't yeah. deliver. Yeah. yeah, and so this is so we're saying that this is at uh, the core of what it means to have heart problems. Is it? It stems down to this self worship that gives rise to different idolatry. And Brian, would you say that this is at the core of what all sin is? Like this is at the core of what all sin in its manifestation looks like? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's, I mean, you, you mentioned the idea of things curving in on yourself and that's Martin Luther's old phrase of incurvatus and in say. It's this Latin idea of sin is ultimately being curved in on yourself. So everything kind of, you have this gravitational pull in your soul that then pulls everything and makes it entirely about you. And yet, I think the Bible would say that this is the main problem with sin is that cuts you off from God because now you're basically trying to be him. He's the one that actually has that gravitational pull. But what's more is the minute those things curve in on, on you, you've now eventually cut yourself off from the joy you wanted in the first place um, because that's not how joy works in the universe we're in. And so you basically, you think you're in control, but you're actually in this tiny broken down corner of the universe pretending and actually being a slave to everything else. It's a really horrible picture. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so if that's sin, and that's the, that's the, the, the problem with our heart, then we should talk about the solution. Um, and, and so what, what do we do about this? This is about heart work and working on your heart. So what do you do? Well, I mean, there's, I think all of scripture, right, paints the picture about what we do about this. And I think one of the helpful ways we've tried to kind of uh, summarize that is in these is in three steps essentially right the three steps of, of of that are essentially the three steps of heart work right of bringing about the this type of internalization and application in our hearts um, and and so the three steps are first we identify self worship right we need to recognize exactly what we've been talking about, right? Number one, recognize the idols that we worship. And number two, recognize that that's um, all about us, right? That, that our hearts and minds have curved in on ourselves. Essentially, we need to recognize that the problem's worse than we realize, right? And that, that, that this actually runs far deeper. You know, that this isn't just, oh, I said some bad things or, oh, yeah, I lied. I probably shouldn't have done that. Or, oh, you know, I, I, I probably shouldn't have treated you that way, right? That, no, no, no. The problem is far deeper and it's far bigger. And it's actually something that, that 
in one way, we on our own can't do anything about. So we, so we need to start by identifying self-worship. Step two is being reminded of gospel truth. In response to recognizing the problem's worse than we realize, we also then need to be reminded that God's grace for that problem is greater than we ever imagined. And as we are reminded of that, as we're reminded of gospel truth, as we're reminded of who God is and who we are and what he's done, um, it inspires the worship that that essentially is the the opposite of um, of our inward turned self worship and, and and step three we need to be then instructed in gospel commands we, we need to be shown then in light of God's grace in light of what he's done in light of the freedom he has given us how he wants us to live right how we can live as the beings we were created to be how, how he uh, created us to function rightly and correctly and in a way that that both is most ultimately fulfilling for us, but even more fundamentally is most glorifying to him. So basically we're talking about the process of reconnecting ourselves to true worship in the universe we actually live in. Yeah. And so let's, let's look at those pieces kind of one by one then. So, so the first one, you know, how do we then identify self-worship? What does that look like? Well, like I said, we, we need to realize that the problem is worse than we think it is. And we need to help one another recognize that the problem is worse than we think it is. Um, and this, this starts by identifying the idols that are motivating, motivating our specific behaviors and thoughts and emotions. Like, what, what are the things that are the most important to me? What are the things that, that drive me, the desires, the lungs, the passions um, that, that I falsely think are going to deliver for me? And then, I mean, and really just kind of identify what, what are the things that are that I'm looking to for ultimate joy. Um, and there's all sorts of different ways to kind of seek to identify what these idols are. You, I mean, you could just ask yourself, like, what are my idols? Right? But some, sometimes people are like, well, I, I don't even know, you know where, where to start. I mean, some like tip-offs, I, I think some things that can like help us recognize what our idols might be are maybe even just certain words like our expectations or our needs or our rights, like whatever we think are, we need, whatever we think is our right is a, something that can very well be a potential idol. Um, when we see misplaced priorities in our lives, perfectionism, workaholism, unfaithfulness, bad stewardship, wh- wherever we see that, we're like, okay, wait, wait, what's causing that, right? What's causing that? Um, that I, if I were to look at it from the outside, I'd be like, no, those, those aren't the right priorities. So then what is motivating me to, to live in that way? Uh, maybe sinful patterns, like we talked about earlier, like lying, cheating, stealing, right? Those are obvious, like I'm doing those things for a reason, right? I'm, I'm willing to sin clearly for a reason. You know, wh- what is it that I'm after? Um, and, and even things like sinful responses, right? When we feel anger, uh, unrighteous anger, self-pity, uh, paralyzation, just overwhelming anxiety, Right? These oftentimes are tied to fears and desires and that, that can help point us to the idols in our lives. Uh, Tim Keller, um, in one of his books, provides four questions. Um, I think it's his book, Counterfeit Gods. Um, he asks, what do you enjoy day- daydreaming about? What do you spend your money on? How do you respond to unanswered prayer or frustrated hopes? What causes uncontrollable emotions? Right, And those four questions for him are like really helpful to p- pointing out what his idols might be. Um, but back to the, the, the definition of, of idolatry by Stuart Scott that you mentioned earlier, like right? what, what is, what do I make more important than God in my attention or desires or devotion or choices? Um, and so in, in identifying those, again, we, we could also, I think, get distracted by just kind of going on idol hunts, right? Like trying to find like, okay, the way I'm going to become like Jesus is to find every single possible idol my heart might have, right? But as Calvin, or I'm sorry, yeah, as Calvin famously said, our, our hearts are idol factories, right? They just keep pumping them out. And so trying to identify every single idol our, our heart has possibly created is kind of like playing whack-a-mole, right? Like it's, it, you just, as once, once you get one, it's like, yeah, they're just popping up all over the place. And so m- more than just trying to like get an exhaustive knowledge of all of our idols, I think really what we're after is identifying th- some of the key idols in our lives and seeing how they are expressing and exposing 
our self-worship, right? Recognizing that, and that's, that's why this, this, this point isn't just um, identifying idols, but it's identifying self-worship, identifying the ways that I, that my life and the, the symptoms that obviously demonstrate how my life is turned in on itself, how my heart is focused on itself and not on God. Um, and, and, and this is where, and if you look at the graphics in your notes, uh, this is where uh, it's helpful to see that Bible transformation then is not just like identifying some idols and making sure you whack them. Because when we do that, um, they, they pop up other places. And I think sometimes actually we can, we can think that or even act like change is actually, uh, the change doesn't come from really identifying our self-worship, but change can oftentimes come from what I like to call like idol swapping, right? I think we, we can tend to swap out idols, swap out like less so- socially acceptable idols for more socially acceptable idols, right? Like the, the, the guy who like worships his career and, you know, is working like a hundred hours a week and is just like completely obsessed with it for him to repent and be like, no, this isn't what life's about. Life isn't about this. Life is about my family. And then to like put pour all of his time and energy into his family and into his kids and into their activities and stuff like that. Now, I don't think there's anybody who would call that guy out, right? Everybody's going to, he's going to get a standing ovation like at his TED talk when he tells the rest of the world that they should be doing it too, right? Like, because that's what life's about, right? Except you can do that without God. You don't have to worship. You can worship yourself consistently through all of that, right? That, that guy may have just become convinced that his family is a idol that can deliver more faithfully than his job. But neither of which is actually about God worship. And so, you know, we, we, what, lots of times people seek to change by simply kind of swapping things, whether it's, you know, short-term fun for long-term financial stability, whether it's, you know, I, numerous people who uh, get off of hard drugs by starting smoking, right? Another example, again, like, that, that's, that's better for you physically, but we haven't dealt with the heart, all because all of these are still simply different forms of self worship, and biblical transformation isn't when we just swap idols. It's when we repent of our self worship and are inspired to worship God. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about the idea of idol swapping as maybe like a change that can happen in your life without God, mm-hmm. um, but it's not spiritual growth the way the Bible describes growing and having God work on your heart the way that um, the Bible talks about. Um, it's change, but it's not spiritual growth. And I think that's really interesting um, because what the Bible says is that we're not called to just swap idols. um, And we're also not called just to get rid of the idols in our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, We're actually called to replace them. The Bible is very clear that we're called to replace the things that stand in front of God, um, the stand in the place of God in our lives, the things that Um, we believe are going to deliver, the way we believe are going to give us the things that actually only God can give us. Um, We're called to replace worship of those things or worship of ourself as we worship those idols with a worship of God. We're called not just to get rid of them and remove them, we're called to replace them with um, with, uh, with the worship of God. And I think that's what the goal of this whole process is as we kind of... uh, finish this first step of identifying our self-worship in the identification we're recognizing that we're not just identifying it and then trying to get rid of it we're actually identifying it and the goal is to replace it with a true worship of um the god who we worship yeah and and, i mean i i actually think that at this point that this could be a little discouraging for some people right because 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 they're like hey you know what wait wait like I've changed a lot, right? Like I'm, I, I, I'm not doing X, Y, and Z, all the bad things I used to be doing. And now I'm just pouring all my time and energy into these good things. And you're telling me I have to like think deeper about that. And, and I think our answer is yes, be, because if we don't think any deeper about this, then, then that's, that's the religion of the Pharisees, right? Like that's the re- religion that, that, that washes the outside of the cup, but and, and so everything, you know, like I've, I've got everything kind of ordered the way it, it should be, but, but the inside of the cup is still dirty and, and, and dead. And, and that's why this process of heart work, taking things deeper, I think is so important and identifying that these, not just the things I'm doing wrong, but, 
but really the the depth of, of sin of sin that um, and the way that it's motivating and, and, and pouring out of my heart. Um, but the good news is that in the midst of that kind of overwhelming um, discouragement that, wow, this is, this is a bigger deal than I thought. And I, I, maybe I, even I'm, I'm more messed up than I thought. Uh, there's still hope. What's the difference between bad things and good things? It's not what they look like on the outside. The difference between a bad thing and a good thing is whether or not it's worshiping God or worshiping yourself. And yeah. so just because you, you, you can say you change from bad things to good things, but at the end of the day, if you're worshiping yourself, you change from bad things to bad things. Yeah. So that's not actual growth. The, the yeah. point of growth, kind of like what we've been saying, is to move towards worship of God. That's what we're made for. It's what the universe is about, and it's what our life should be headed towards. Mm-hmm. And so you got to identify self-worship to move in that direction. But then what you said step two mm-hmm. is be reminded of gospel truth. So essentially, you know, the gospel message Christ is the Son of God sent to earth to die in our place, to take the punishment for our sins, to rise from the grave, be Lord of uh, the universe, and to return one day triumphantly. And and if you turn and believe in him, you're completely forgiven, adopted into God's family, born again. You have an inheritance in heaven. Uh, this is the, the gospel message. Now, if we're going to remind ourselves of that, is step two then just, like, is that just, do we just repeat that to ourselves? Well, in one sense, yes. <laughs> like, like, I mean, I mean in, one, in one sense, like, like, yes, we, sometimes that's exactly what we need, right? Sometimes we need to be like, no, I just need to remember the basics. Like, and I just need to remember that, you know what, I'm so discouraged and so overwhelmed by the weight and the depth of my sin. I just need to remember that, no, I, I'm forgiven. Um, but, but in another sense, no, right? Because just repeating that statement, just, re, you know, even just taking what you said on putting it on record and just repeating it over and over, like it isn't enough, right? God's not just calling us to like repeat and remember just kind of guess a, a line of truth. He's calling us to set our minds on the reality of who he is uh, by reminder of, of what he's done and all the implications of that for us as his children. He's, he's calling us essentially to, to remember the relationship with him in which we live and, and to relate to him on, on an increasingly deep and, and, and fundamental level. And, and I think this is what it means when, when Paul writes in Romans 12 that, that we're not to be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing, the renewal of your minds. This is, this isn't just uh, memorize this, you know, take these two verses and call me in the morning, right? Like God is um, in the process of, as we remind ourselves of gospel truth, God is in the process of renewing our minds so that we, they might be set on him and and really uh, understand life in, in the midst of of reality, the real universe in which we live, and the real relationship with Him that we have every moment of every day. And so, Colossians three actually provides us an example of this, and I think it might be helpful just to kind of walk walk through this both in in, in this point and the next. But in Colossians three, in the first five verses, we we get just a a description of some of some gospel truth, right? Truths about who God is, what He's done. And, it says this, it says, if then, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Right? And I think that the, the temptation here can be to just like read that and be like, okay, yeah, 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 like I know God g- gave us uh a bunch of good stuff, right? And kind of move on. But I think what what scripture is doing in, in places like this is renewing our minds, reminding us of gospel truth, right? It's reminding us of, of what he's done, right? He's just, he starts out, if then you have been raised with Christ, right? Just to even stop and think about the implications of what it means that I was spiritually dead, right? That I was... Uh, not able to follow God, not able to, to live the life that he's called me to live, but I've been raised, made alive with Christ. I mean, the, the implications for that are incredible, and they touch down on in every different aspect of life. 
Um, I think the, the same is true with in verse three, when he says, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God, right? That like, wait, my, my true life, my true life isn't my career. My true life isn't even my family, right? But God has hidden and given me true life in him. And so that's, and he's hidden that it, with Christ in God. Now, I mean, even if you're listening to this, right, you're probably like, I mean, there's a part of me, like, I don't even know what that means, <laughs> right? Like that's an incredible mystery. And taking the time to wrestle through how my life being hidden with him, being owned by him, being, uh, being secure in him, um, begins to renew our minds and remind us again and again and again of who he is. It just shakes us out of our uh, myopic and earthly and temporal view of things to be reminded of this truth, to say that your life is hidden with Christ in God. Um, so often, I mean, the idea of like seeking our life here, meaning uh, this kind of term life doesn't mean just being alive, but this idea of your purpose, your everything, the reason for being, the reason you live, this idea of like uh, us trying to find our life in the things of this earth or the things of this world, the created things, the idolatries that that uh, that make these you know false promises that we think that are they're going to they're going to satisfy us in ways that only God can this gospel truth just like shakes us and wakes us up and says, no, 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 that's not who you are. That's not who your identity is. That's not where your life is. That's not who you are in the world. That's not what your soul lives for. That's not what's going to satisfy your soul. None of that is true because this truth just comes in and just like smacks us across the head in the midst of our distractions and confusions. Um, To be reminded of this gospel truth is such a powerful aspect of uh, of what it means to to battle and be transformed and to grow into Christ likeness. Yeah, and and I think that w- when we read things like that, and even when we th- when when people hear something like that, there there might be part of the time when we hear that and we're like, okay, but like that does it doesn't seem to be true, right? Right? It doesn't feel real, right? And which again, I think just exposes the problem, right? That if it doesn't feel true, that it doesn't seem to be real. Then then what I'm really what I'm really wrestling with is, is doubt and unbelief, right? And what I, and I do need to be reminded of truth that, that the, the facade that this world has painted seems more real to me than the reality of the universe, that the, the God of the universe has offered and given to me through Christ, his son, and not even the fa- only the facade, but also our feelings too, yeah. right? Yeah. So God's truth stands above and an authority over what the world tells us life is about and above and beyond what even our feelings. In this moment, I don't feel like a new creation, but God says you are a new creation. Mm -hmm. And so his truth stands above and an authority over even our feelings. It says, I think in 1 John, that God is greater than our hearts. This idea that, um, that the truth of God and who he is stands even above our experience. When we don't feel it, we still hold on to it and we need to be reminded of it because of that disconnect that we feel. Absolutely. And, and this is what I, I love about, I mean, in verse four, he goes into the, the future. He says, and, and when Christ who is your life appears, you, then you will also appear with him in glory. Like there's a, there's a future promise here, Absolutely. Like, like of what the future holds. And I think so many of our idols are about us trying to control and trying to get a, a certain promise for our futures. Hope. Right? Exactly. Yeah, we, we, they're, they're what we think might give us hope, but it's all false hope. But this is a guaranteed true hope for those who believe in Christ that we are going to appear with him in glory, with him in glory. Like, th- th- that's that's something that your your next promotion at work can't even begin to, co- to, to compare to, right? And yet, we cling to that promotion because we forget about this incredible future promise that we can have open. And so, so what, 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 do, what do we do about that? Well, we need to be reminded. Yeah, and you see this, I mean, I, you see this throughout the Bible. I mean, this is a dangerous thing for us to talk about because we can talk for like 30 hours probably on this over and over and over again. But throughout the Bible, it's like, remember, 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 remember. You're prone to forget. Remember, 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 remember. And all of these de- declarative statements um, that just like 
pierce through and cut through all of the all of the distractions and baloney in our lives that 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 uh, uh, keep us from seeing with God's eyes, right? And says, "No, this is what is true. Look mm. to this future. Look to this truth. Look to where your life actually is. Look to what Christ has done for you. Look to what that means for your life. Hold fast to that truth um, and let it be. Let your heart and your mind be reminded of it because you desperately need to hold on to that truth. I think it's such just a such a powerful, even encouraging for me as I'm sitting here." Um, you know, on a Monday thinking about my own life and all these other things like, oh, wow, like I need to hear this truth in this moment right now um, every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's so to your point, Matt, this is something that you're finding throughout scripture. And so in a lot of ways, it really is your time in the word and having other people speak the word to you um, where you're going to have the ability to be reminded of gospel truth. And it's probably not just in uh, certain particular passages, you're going to see it in a lot of different places. So for example, like Galatians 5, where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then it says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so what you're seeing then is this idea that the, the gospel implications, the idea that you have crucified the flesh, that you have died with Christ and have been raised to newness of life in him, produces a spirit-empowered radical awareness and uh, growth in things like love and joy and peace. Like these are gospel implications. These are ways of being reminded of gospel truth that you have a newness of life here. And those are relatively, that, that, those are relatively easy, but then there are some passages that might be a little more difficult. So here's one, uh, Ruth four. So, you know, Boaz takes Ruth and she becomes his wife and, and the women say to Naomi, um, after uh, uh, she bears a son, uh, bless, or after Ruth bears a son, um, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse, and the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So there's a passage you might read in your, you know, your, your daily Bible reading. How do we find gospel implications in that? Well, I, I love, I mean, particularly the <laughs> Matt shrugs. <laughs> <laughs> Teach me, Scott. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love the, uh, I love things like the Old Testament narratives because I think that in, in, in so many different ways, they teach us about who God is. They teach us about truth. And, and what this teaches and what the story of Ruth teaches us is, I mean, numerous different things, but just on a very basic level, it teaches us about God's power to redeem, about his care for his people, about how he works out his plan, um, even in situations that seem and feel hopeless, feel discouraging, uh, feel like a complete and utter fail. I mean, th there was a time in Ruth's life where she just looked at her life and just probably felt like a, like a failure. Like everything, like everything always turns out wrong, right? That's an interpretation that you could have in, in her life, but it paints this picture of how God is always at work, always gracious, always. And, and, and you're like, well, but that's, that's kind of before the gospel, right? That's the old Testament. So how is that a gospel implication? Well, th the fact that God is always at work the fact that he is um, loving and compassionately working in each one of our lives, bringing about his plan in mysterious ways that we don't even recognize at times, uh, is true in our lives in unique ways because of and through the gospel. Right? I mean, our relationship with God is, as Christians, is established by the gospel, and and a fundamental part of our. Uh, relationship with him is that his spirit, his very spirit dwells inside of us, right? And I mean, just like we looked at in the Galatians passage, right? This, it wasn't a passage about commands. This is a passionate passage about that what's true about the spirit of God who is dwelling inside of us, that it produces these things. And what's also true about the spirit of God who, who lives inside of us is that this is the same God who loves his people, who sovereignly directs his people, who works out his his perfect plans for our lives and for his people generally um, without fail, 
constantly faithfully. And, and so we can be reminded about who he is, about how he works, about how he fulfills and keeps his promises. As the, I mean, as we see through here, we see it, when it talks about at the end that they named the son Obed and he was the father of Jesse and the father of David. They, they're reminding us, look, God is still, even throughout all the ups and the downs and the mess, still keeping his promise to Abraham, still keeping his, his promise to God's people, still keeping his promise for, to, to each, yeah, each one of us. And, um, and ultimately, it reminds us of his faithfulness to his promises. And we can take that and apply it to all the promises, all the New Testament promises that he gives to us. It reminds us of, of how faithful he will be to keep those as well. Okay, so that's not it, though. Like, at some point, there's a way you can almost feel like, okay, cool, so now I'm reminded of the gospel. There are implications, and there's a lot to explore there, but there's more. There's a third step, this idea of being instructed in gospel commands. So how does that work? Well, so when we are reminded of gospel truth, we're reminded of who we are, it it, it doesn't just... Um, we don't just do it kind of as an intellectual exercise. We do it because it inspires our worship of God. I think sometimes it's easy to think about how we, you know, looking back to the um, diagram we looked at, at earlier, you know, how, do, how do you go from self-worship to God worship, right? Well, you, we make that transition by being reminded of what's true, and that inspires, oh, oh I'm, I'm reminded, yes, of who God is, of what he's done, of his power, of his... Um, of the incredible, of how incredibly glorious he is. And that inspires my worship. And then that worship manifests itself in our lives, practically in our lives. Right? We, we, we want to then glorify him. We want to, to demonstrate that worship. We want to live out in, in a way that honors him and that declares his glory to the world around us. And so we need to be instructed then and how to do that. Okay, you're like, okay, I, God is amazing. He is glorious. He's beautiful. He, he is so worthy of my praise. So how do I praise him? Right? Well, what does that look like? How do I, do I just, do I just sing songs? Right? Do I, um, how do I live in a way that, that, that glorifies him in that way? And so scripture then teaches us, instructs us how to live in ways that glorify him in ways that, that, that display that worship. And so, so in the, that same vein, Colossians 3 kind of continues by telling us, okay, then in light of who you are, in light of what God's done, as you worship him, live this way. And it, and it, and it, it includes kind of putting off certain things and putting on others. Um, and start, he starts with in verse 5, it says, put to death, therefore, and he's right, therefore, in light of what God has done in light of who you are, as you worship him, put to death, therefore, what's earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming, and these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, is what we've been talking about, at, after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And so here he gives us specific things that we're called to put off. He's basically, if you're going to worship God, if you want to live that, that life that, that praises him, that worships him, that honors him in light of everything that he's done and who he is, then it looks like this. Well, it, it looks like not engaging in sexual immorality, right? It looks like not um, putting away covetousness because you, you don't need to anymore. You've been given everything you could ever desire in Christ. Um, it looks like putting away anger and wrath and malice, slander, obscene talk, right? It means walking away and putting away those things um, because that's the, that's the old self. And, and so now these aren't the things that we do to earn our way to God, like we've talked about before, but these are, this is what it looks like to live a life that worships and honors and glorifies him. Yeah, it's, there's a response to what God has done. Um, and there's this picture of almost like a new allegiance in your heart, in your life to 
a God who's done so much to rescue you and loved you so perfectly um, that how could you not want to now live for him? These commands just flow so naturally out of the experience of being reminded of the truth of the gospel that says, wait a minute, all of these things, like Brian mentioned earlier, all of these things I've looked to as my hope never have delivered. They never have satisfied my soul. They never have given me the joy that I thought they would give me. They've always um, crushed me and I've ended up enslaved to them because they've never, they've never been able to, to uh, provide. They're not strong enough to give me what I thought they would give me. And yet there's a God who is strong enough to give me what my soul absolutely needs and who has loved me perfectly and been gracious unto me. How could I not want to turn and live my life for him in response to what he's done? And I love this Colossians passage because uh, he's both remind, Paul's both reminding us of the truth of the gospel seeing that, you know, all of these things about who you are and what you've done, right, that we talked about. Um, And then in response to that, seeing that you've put off this old self, seeing that God has radically transformed you, now live this new life that, 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 uh, that he has given you in Christ. It's such a beautiful picture of that transformation that God does in us when we encounter the gospel. Yeah, and, and, and then in addition to what we're called to put off, he then also tells us what this life, what a life that's glorifying to God, a life that is genuinely worshiping God looks like. Or he says, put on then as God's chosen ones. Again, he's pointing back, right? I mean, there's, there's like a little reminder in here. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, right? We, we see here just this, so many different instructions, and he, he goes on and on, but uh, that, that, that give us a picture for what a God-glorifying life looks like. And, and, and again, I think sometimes we, we can use terms like that kind of flippantly, right? Like, oh, I, just, you know, I want to live a God-glorifying life, right? I just want to do what's right is kind of what we mean. But in light of the gospel truths, as our hearts well up with honor and worship for him, we, we experience this genuine desire to live a life that truly glorifies him, that doesn't turn in on itself, but is lived praising him and worshiping him. And he says, and that's, that looks like compassion. It looks like kindness. It looks like humility and meekness and forgiveness. And so this is a similar situation then where you, like we've just seen in Colossians 3, sort of one large chunk of scripture where you're seeing uh, uh, the idea of being reminded of the gospel and then instructed in gospel commands. Um, But this is also in other passages of the Bible. So like Philippians 2, it's a pretty classic passage where Paul's saying, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy... In other words, if you've been reminded of the gospel, then complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And so you're seeing a different passage, same idea. These are being reminded of the gospel and its implications, then like leveraging that to see here are some gospel commands of of humility, basically. Be humble, consider others more significant, be united. And then there are other places like 1 Timothy 5, uh, verses 1 through 3, which is a little bit of a, of a different kind of vibe. Like, Don't rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. What, how do we see this as gospel commands? This might just look like a list of things to do. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a perfect example, right? Because Paul is writing to Timothy in, in the context of this in this same gospel context, right? Everything to him. Mean, these aren't instructions of, okay, Timothy, how, here's how to make sure you do it, right? He, he's five steps to success. As exactly. A pastor. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. He, you know, he's not, he, here's your household rules, you know, make sure that everyone knows them. All right. These are guiding principles that help Timothy to know how he can worship God well honor him and live out this new identity. He's constantly reminded that he has in Christ in, in relation to older men, in relation to younger men, in relation to uh, older women, younger women, 
uh, right? And, and, he, and he even talks about widows specifically. He says, look, as, as God has so loved you and cared for you and met your, your needs when you were helpless, I, I, I want you to live that kind of life as well. Like that's what glorifies him. This is what care for those like widows who, who can't care for themselves, right? Who have no other hope to, to, to no other physical, in that sense, hope and, and manifest his love to them, right? And so he shows us then, and so all these instructions then are, uh, are, are essentially gospel commands. They're how we're called to live in light of the gospel. And, and in that First Timothy passage, another aspect of that is the family tie, right? Like yeah. it's as a father, or as brothers, there's a sense of family. How are we family? How, are the, how is this old, older guy a family? How is he like a father to me? Well, we've been bought with the blood of Christ together and united in, in that way. And therefore, we are a family together, brothers, sisters, mothers, father. Like we're connected intrinsically through what being united to Christ in a powerful way. And that makes it uh, flowing out of gospel truth in a really powerful way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm afraid that when people think of these as gospel commands that, okay, when we're like remi- being reminded of the gospel and the forgiveness we have and the, and, and everything God has done for us, that that makes these commands feel less important. Right. But, but that doesn't make them less important. Right. Is, is it because, Oh no, the only way these can be important if they're, if they're like on the front edge. No, but if these truly are responses to the unimaginable grace and love God has shown us. And that doesn't make them unimportant. That makes them more important. And so in that same sense, obedience then to these commands, to these calls is, is the only thing that makes sense in light of what God has done for us. And so it's important then to strive for obedience, to, 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 to strive for holiness um, to, to identify these, these areas in our lives where we fall short and to remember how good God has been to us and to strive to, to reflect our worship to him in, in so many different ways. And, and in this way, heart work then it is hard work. It, it, it's not easy, right? This isn't just some, okay, we'll just, hey, you know what? Remember God forgave you and it'll come easy. Like it doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. It, number one, it's hard to remember, <laughs> right? It's hard to remember uh, the reality uh, that we, in which we live. Secondly, it, it, it's hard to fight to live a life that genuinely glorifies him when our flesh does scream out to uh, turn inside on ourselves constantly. But it's also the very definition of God's will for our lives, right? Paul writes to the Thessalonians, right? This is the will, the will of God your sanctification. This, it's the will of God for us to become more like Christ. And we do that through this, this hard and, and just central and important work of heart work. All right. So we're talking about walking with God in this class, knowing him more deeply throughout our lives. And we're talking now about heart work as a part of that, internalizing and applying what God has said. And so here's what we did in this session. We talked about the problem of idolatry in our hearts, how it's everywhere and, uh, and, it, and deeply related to self-worship. And then we talked about the three steps of heart work that, that address that problem, identifying self-worship, remembering gospel truth, and being instructed in gospel commands. And so as you leave here, some practical questions for you. Um, first, what are some idolatries that you can identify in your own life that show up as self-worship? What are some ways that you can identify idols as related to self-worship in your life? Second, what gospel truth do you need to be reminded of to inspire your heart to worship God and not yourself? What is a gospel truth that you can remind yourself of to help you? And then third, what gospel commands are God call, is God calling you to follow and obey? Like, What are some of the commands that God would have you follow and obey? And this, these questions are a way of you working through those three steps and you yourself getting more acquainted with worshiping God instead of yourself and finding more joy in it. We'll see you next time.